Howdy folks and welcome back to Home with the Gnome where today I'm going to be cooking a lasagna recipe. I realise it's it's been a while since I did one of these. You can probably blame Cyberpunk 2077 for that and Assassin's Creed Valhalla and uh, all the Warcraft Shadowlands and well you get the idea. But anyway we're back um, and the recipe that I'm going to be using for this lasagna is one that I'm not 100% copying but I'm modifying from another food YouTuber who goes by the name of I believe his name's pronounced Adam Ragasse, and he's very, very good, and I do recommend him. Uh, link down below in the video description to the recipe that inspired this. This is going to be some lasagna. So, ingredients. Obviously, you're going to need pasta sheets. Now, you can make your own pasta, if such is your wish, uh, but that takes a long time. And at some point, I am going to start making my own pasta. I've got a pasta roller ready to do it, just not today. You're also going to need... For the uh, cheese sauce, we're going to be making a bechamel, or as I believe they call it in the southern USA states, a roux. So we're going to need butter, unsalted, we're going to need milk, we're going to need plain flour, and I'm going to be using Pecorino Romano cheese, but use whatever cheese you like. Uh, Pecorino Romano is very, very salty. This is going to be a salty dish. I'm not going to be adding a lot of salt to the meat, um, because it's just not really going to need it. Speaking of, we have about two pounds or one kilogram of beef mince. I'm also going to be using chicken liver. And this is going to go in with the aromatics, the leeks, the carrots and the onions, uh, just to add a slightly unusual flavour to the lasagna. But trust me, it's delicious. And it doesn't overpower the flavour as much as you might imagine because liver does have quite a strong flavour, but we're not going to be using a huge amount. And I think that just about covers it, so we're going to get started. So, as many of you are probably aware, and for anybody who's new to this channel, I'll fill you in on the details. Um, I don't like onions. I'm not a huge fan of carrots or leeks either. However, I do like the flavour of onions, carrots and leeks. I realise that sounds a bit weird, but it's more of a texture thing with me. Now, you could just not add onions, carrots, leeks, and various different aromatic vegetables to the lasagna mix, but then it's not going to taste like a lasagna. So, I'm going to blend them all, and basically make a puree out of them, so I still get those flavours, I just don't have to bite down on the texture of a bit of onion. I'm weird like that. And then, because, you know, I'm just shit, and really shouldn't be allowed to have a cooking channel, <laughs> Then I remembered to add the chicken liver, <laughs> which is also supposed to go in at this stage. So slap the chicken liver into the mix, and then we're going to blend it all again. This time with all of the ingredients. It smells really good, by the way. <laughs> this time with all of the actual recommended ingredients. So now for the beefsteak mince. This much is about two pounds or one kilogram. The actual original recipe calls for um, three pounds. Um, obviously, that's for making American portions. <laughs> this much will comfortably feed a family of four or myself and Rita for two days. So that's what we're going to be using. Plus, if you're using three full pounds of beef steak mince, you're really going to struggle when it comes to browning it off in a bowl of any size. You'll probably have to do it in batches. In fact, this much, I should probably be doing in two batches as well. Otherwise, the bowl is gonna end up getting overwhelmed with the juices as the fat on the mince melts off. So that's what I'm gonna do. And all we're really doing at this stage is browning the meat off so you want to use a, a high heat because we're just browning it off don't worry the whole thing's going to be cooking for around about four hours it's going to get cooked all we're doing here is releasing some of the flavor unfortunately for some strange reason during this next clip my microphone decided to turn itself off halfway through so voice over time i'm at the point where i've just finished browning off the second batch of beefsteak mince. All of the moisture has evaporated out and now I'm going to add back the first batch of mince. 
And now it's time to add the next ingredient, half a bottle of white wine. You can use red, I'm using white simply because I happen to have half a bottle of white wine handy. And I do recommend that you at least use a wine, I mean it doesn't have to be an expensive wine, it probably shouldn't be an expensive wine, but do at least try to use a wine that you would drink if you weren't using it for cooking. You often hear people saying this wine's not very good, but I can use it for cooking. I mean, I get what they're saying, but at the same time, this is an ingredient that you're putting into something that you're going to eat. If you don't like how it tastes, why would you put it into something that you're going to eat? Make sense? Yes? No? Anyway, we're going to keep stirring this for about 15-20 minutes until the wine has all simmered off. And as advertised, we're back around about 15 minutes later. The wine has pretty much all simmered off and it's time to start tossing in the rest of the ingredients. Start with a very generous helping of tomato puree. Don't be afraid. Get that stuff in there. Get it good and stirred in. And you're going to need to be quick with this because there's not a lot of moisture in there and there's a very real danger that you're going to start burning stuff on the bottom of the pan. So once that's incorporated into the mince, next ingredient, although technically this is the next four ingredients, this is the puree that I made in the blender out of the onions, leeks, carrots and chicken liver. So I'm going to get this mixed in with everything else. And while I'm doing that, but jingles I hear you cry. What happens if you're not going to make a puree out of your aromatic vegetables and chicken liver? Uh, what if you prepare them the way God intended? If that's the case, and for most of you it probably will be, you would have basically cooked off and browned off those vegetables in the same pan before doing the mince. Once they're browned off, decant them into a separate bowl, do the mince, and then add them back in at this stage. And it is fairly important, I do recommend, that you do all of the cooking in this same pan, because it keeps all of the flavours in one place. Now this next step is entirely optional, uh, but I do like a bit of... I still don't know how to pronounce it. Dijon? Dion? Fancy French mustard. <laughs> so, um, if you like it, add some in. If you don't, don't. That's the beauty of cooking. It's an art, not a science. Baking is a science. If you don't follow the instructions religiously in baking, it will go horribly wrong. Uh, but in cooking, there's only really two things you can do wrong. Undercook or overcook. Other than that, feel free to experiment. Okay, once that's all had a chance to get to know each other, catchphrase courtesy of binging with Babish, it's time to add the next ingredient. And that is going to be two cans of peeled plum tomatoes. The original recipe did call for three, but, well, the original recipe also calls for an entire two pounds of beefsteak mince. Fortunately, I'm not feeding a family full of Americans, so... <laughs> two cans it is. Oh, come on, America, you know it's true. I've been to America many times. I've seen the size of your portions. They're fantastic. Uh, but what I'm cooking here will be more than enough to feed myself and Rita for two days. So, two cans of tomatoes it is. We're going to mix those in. And once that's done, we're going to leave this on a low simmer for four hours. Well, four hours in total. We're going to be back after three hours. Well, we're going to be back every 20 minutes to give it a good stir. But after three hours, we're going to come back and we're going to add the final ingredients. And then we'll be making the sauce uh, for the rest of the lasagna while this is cooking off in the final hour. So, three hours later... And um, as you can see, that's thickening up quite nicely. It's important, by the way, that you do come down. You don't just leave it here for three hours and then come back. Uh, because, well, there's heat involved, so some of the mince is going to stick to the bottom of the pan. And that's fine. This is why I'm using a wooden spatula. Uh, because it's best for scraping up. When you come down every 20 minutes or so to give it a stir, scrape up all of the burnt yeah burnt is the right word I suppose all of the burnt meat from the bottom of the pan and mix it back in there because that stuff tastes fantastic so after three hours we've still got another hour to go um, but while that's finishing off I'm going to be starting on the cheese sauce that's going to be going with it but this is the point where you come down and you give it a taste and then you add any extra ingredients 
seasoning and so on and so on that you think is necessary. Okay, that could actually use a little bit of salt. Not a lot. Like I said, it's fairly salty. And it's also going to get quite acidic. Uh, because what I'm also going to be adding at this point, and this is entirely up to you, because I didn't actually include any garlic in it. So some garlic, garlic salt, garlic granules. Some of that's going in. Uh, you can skip this entirely if you just add garlic. Um, at the ingredient stage with your carrots and your leeks and your onions. I'm going to add a little parsley. Mix all of that in. Again, you can add whatever you want. Oregano, or if you're American, oregano. Um, whatever herbs and spices you feel it needs after you've come down and tasted it at this point but the one thing that I'm going to add uh, which you won't normally see in a lasagna recipe is balsamic vinegar and this is going to give it an acidic taste but well it just give it a try you may be surprised but this and the chicken liver I think really elevates the taste and, oh, it smells good. <clears throat> so I'm going to leave that for another hour. And then half an hour from now, I will come back and start preparing the cheese sauce. So everything should be finished. And then we can actually build the lasagna at the same time. Right, now we're going to make the cheese sauce. And I've done this sort of thing before. Basically, it's what the French call a bechamel. And uh, what they call in Louisiana, the roux. And it's very, very simple. It, we're basically making a thickening agent for our sauce and it's butter. I've used unsalted because there's going to be plenty of salt in the finished dish anyway although it doesn't really matter. Again you'll taste it if it needs more salt you season it with salt but it shouldn't. Um, flour and milk and then because we're using this as the basis for a cheese sauce we'll also be adding some cheese at the end of the process. So you melt the butter um, the original recipe calls for a full stick of butter, but again, the original recipe uses half again as many ingredients, so I've used about three quarters. Melt it down, be careful not to burn it, and then we're going to add flour. I'm using plain flour, and it's going to make a big, doughy, horrible, clumpy, nasty mess and that's fine it's supposed to mix all of that in that's not nearly enough flour it's still a liquid I'm adding it a bit at a time though because it will form lumps and I want to minimize that more flour I should probably use a spoon for this let me get a spoon There we go. Much better. I'll whisk that in. More flour. How much flour? Well, I'm just kind of eyeballing it. I'm sure there are probably measurements for this. I don't know what they are. But you're going to be putting a lot of flour in until it just turns into a nasty, thick, clumpy mess. Kind of like that. Although we're not there yet. Yeah, another spoonful and we should be good. Now I'm doing this on a, a medium low heat. You, you don't want it to burn. And because what you're making here is going to start off being so incredibly dry, it's going to be very easy to burn it. Wax 
some more in there. And that should be enough for our purposes. There we go, it's turned into a sludge. And that's perfect. Now, you might be sitting, sitting there thinking to yourself, that doesn't look like any kind of cheese sauce I ever saw. You're absolutely right. First we've got to add the milk. There we go, that's a just about the perfect consistency. Now, drop the cap, don't worry, it'll be fine. We're going to be using all of this milk anyway. You add the milk, just a bit at a time. You don't dump all of the milk in. You, you need to get it mixed in thoroughly. And this is going to look... It's a weird thing about doing a roux or a bechamel because it looks terrible right up until the point when it's perfect. This is going to make a lot of sauce because we're making a fairly large lasagna. So just keep trying not to spill any over the side of your pan and mixing it in until eventually it achieves a sauce-like consistency rather than the paste-like consistency that it currently has. This is going to take a lot of milk, easily more than a pint. But if you were to add all of the milk in one go, it would just turn everything into a horrible, clumpy, nasty mess. You'd never get the clumps out. Because adding all of that milk is going to take the temperature down too quickly, too much. Which is why you add the milk a bit at a time. And the secret to making a roux or a bechamel, and I'm not claiming that I've mastered it, it's all in the mixing of the milk into this clumpy, nasty, horrible mess. Still not quite there yet. I mean, this is roughly the consistency that you want it to be. But I'm going to add a shit ton of Pecorino Romano sheep's milk cheese to this, which is a very salty and acidic cheese. In fact, my Portuguese commie chef is busy making lots of noise while grating it. <laughs> you're wondering what that dinging noise was in the background and of course the cheese is going to thicken this up considerably so that was how much was this two pints of milk although we'd already used some so slightly less than a litre in total that's going in here And you'll know that it's done and you're ready well, when it looks like this. And it's no longer an absolute chore to force the whisk through it. Or you give it the spoon test. If it just coats the back of the spoon like that, you know it's ready. And if my Portuguese commie chef could stop making rattling and banging noises while I'm recording, <laughs> we'll add the cheese. Okay. So, here's the cheese. Um, schools of thought differ on how you should actually add the cheese to the roux. Um, some people say you should take the roux off the heat because adding the cheese at that point, if it's too hot, can cause the cheese to go all stringy but at the same time you do want the cheese to actually melt into the bechamel so I'm leaving it on a, a low heat and all of this this is an entire block of Pecorino Romano which is a sheep's milk cheese so it's very acidic I'm going for lots of acidic flavors today balsamic vinegar Pecorino Romano cheese you don't have to use Pecorino Romano you can use any cheese you like um, Parmesan works very, very well. If all you have is cheddar, then use cheddar. But I've got Pecorino Romano, and it really does add a different flavour to the whole thing, so that's what I'm using. That's about half of the cheese. And of course, this is going to thicken the sauce up. 
Just stir it in. Oh, this smells great. And then we're going to add the rest. This is a lot of cheese. But like bacon, there's no such thing as too much of it. Right, now for the fun part. Now we actually build the lasagna. Uh, like I said, I'm using pre-bought pasta sheets purely because this would take two days <laughs> if I was actually making the fresh pasta. Um, if you want to make the fresh pasta, if you know how to make the fresh pasta, knock yourself out. Me, I'm using pre-made pasta sheets. So, first pasta sheet in the bottom of a baking bowl, dish, tray, whatever. I'm going to layer this with a generous helping of the meat, which of course is mixed in with all of the vegetables and the tomatoes and all the other good stuff. It seems like there's an awful lot of meat in that bowl, and there is, but you'd be surprised how quickly you can start to run out. Okay, anyway, next. And this isn't rocket science, I'm pretty sure everybody knows how lasagna is constructed. A further sheet of uh, lasagna, and then use a different spoon. I'm gonna scoop up, oh, give it a stir. It's uh, cooled down a little. And a layer of cheese sauce. Oh, that's good and thick. You can make this even thicker and stringier and uh, chewier by adding mozzarella. I've seen, oh, I missed. I've seen Jamie Oliver do that. Um, although he does the cheese sauce completely differently from this. Get in there, you bad boy. I'll have a little bit more there actually. Because the one thing that you can never have too much of, actually the two things that you can never have too much of, are cheese and bacon. In fact, cheese and bacon is for winners. But that's a different story. Okay, another layer. And you're basically going to keep doing this until you have filled the dish. And you can't get any more in there. Plenty of cheese. Don't worry if you don't use all of the cheese sauce. Um, this can go into a bowl or a jug or a container or whatever. You can stick it in the fridge and use it in anything else that requires a cheese sauce. Any other pasta dish that uses the cheese sauce, go ahead and use this. It will keep in the fridge for a couple of days. Right, the final layer. And uh, yeah, we have used one entire packet of fresh pasta is going to be just a little, just a very, very thin coating of meat. It, it doesn't matter if it's patchy and you've missed bits, because this is basically, because it's on top and it's directly exposed to the heat in the oven where we're going to be putting it, this is basically going to burn. This is going to be the crispy bit. And it's going to taste good. And the genius part of this recipe, for which I have to give uh, full credit to Adam Ragasse, or however you pronounce his name, is, well at this point, once you've actually constructed the pasta, what you should be doing is putting it into an oven for 40 minutes, and that will finish cooking everything. But what we're going to do instead, is put it in the oven for 20 minutes. And then it's going to come out of the oven and it's going to go in the fridge for half an hour. And there's a method to this madness. And you'll see why. But first we're going to put this in the oven. So with the uh, leftover meat, or some of it at least, we're going to see what our Mexican judge thinks. Boo-boo. <laughs> What's this, boo? Go on then. 
think that's a thumbs up from the Mexican judge. <laughs> Is that good poo? He says, shut up, I'm eating. <laughs> Can't talk now, I'm busy. <laughs> Whoa. That was a good boy. 20 minutes later, in a 200 degree centigrade or about 400 Fahrenheit oven, it comes out and it looks like that. And it doesn't look too different to how it looked when it went in. It's because it's only half cooked. And the reason we're only half cooking it, because we're not eating this today, that's going in the fridge overnight and we're going to finish cooking it and eating it tomorrow, will be revealed when I put it back in the oven and finish cooking it tomorrow. There's a special reason for it. And trust me, it's going to be good. Right, we're back on uh, day two of the Great British Lasagna Bake. The pasta that we half cooked last night is now out of the fridge. And this is where the genius of, uh, I still don't know how to pronounce his name properly, Adam Rakazay's uh, lasagna recipe comes in. I've already prepared the lasagna. So all I've done is after taking it out of the fridge overnight, is I've cut it into four sections. And the reason we've done that, and the reason why we only half cooked it yesterday for 20 minutes instead of the full 40 before putting it into the fridge, is because the thing about lasagna is the best bits of lasagna are the crispy bits around the edges. And if you just put that into the oven and cook it for the full 40 minutes, when you come to cut it up into portions, it's going to be sloppy, it's going to, you're going to risk bits of lasagna going everywhere. And the only crispy bits around the edges are going to be the bits around the edges of the pan. But if you only half cook it the day before, then put it in the fridge overnight, it comes out of the fridge cold and firm, you can cut it up into four pieces, and then you can cook individual bits for the remaining 20 minutes. And they're going to all have the good crispy bits around the edges. And that's the genius of this recipe. So having done that, I'm going to put them on a tray. I've got the oven preheated to uh, 200 Fahrenheit, sorry, 200 Celsius, and around about 400 Fahrenheit. And they're going to go into the oven, or two slices at least, the rest are going to go back in the fridge, and we'll have them tomorrow uh, for another 20 minutes. Oh, very cheeky. Right, uh, while that's in the fridge, fridge, oven, <laughs> sorry, um, you can see why I misidentify things so easily in World of Warships. Um, <laughs> while that's in the oven, I'm going to be preparing a simple tomato sauce. The ingredients of which, like I said, it's going to be simple, are one can of peeled plum tomatoes, Don't worry, we'll let that bit out. <laughs> a couple of cloves of garlic, and um, what I believe you refer to in America as oregano, although we call it oregano here in the UK. Tomato, tomato, you know, whatever. That's all going to go in the blender. And once it's been blended together, it's literally just a case of uh, heating it up. Okay, that I thought it was a low heat. <laughs> Where's my stirrer? Oh, there it is. Yeah, that seems fine. I don't, I don't think we're actually burning anything. Okay, we're good. Uh, it's going to take substantially less than the 20 minute cooking time that the lasagna has in order to get this ready. And there's probably too much in here for just two servings of lasagna, but this is fine. Um, if there's too much, I'm gonna stick the remainder in a freezer bag, and then we'll have it tomorrow with the rest of the lasagna. I've been waiting for this for a long time. When was the last time we had this? About a month ago, I think. Yeah, probably. Oh, it's just so good. I know it's gonna be amazing. I feel the love. <laughs> well, this isn't the first uh, lasagna rodeo we've had, so I've kind of... This is the best one, though. Oh, okay. Yeah. I feel romanced. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, Rita, we have to keep this PG. <laughs> oh my god. This is the best lasagna I've ever had in my life. Oh, that's good to know. 
And of course the point of half cooking it and putting it in the fridge overnight was you can cut it into four sections mm -hmm. and each section that you cook gets the crispy mm. browned edges. And the... Oh, it's so good. The sauce is really simple. It's just a can yeah. of... It's just a can of tomatoes, some garlic, some mm. oregano and some salt. That's it. Everything is on point. I can taste pretty much everything in there. Oh. Right, well, I need to get myself a plate of that. <laughs> because I haven't eaten anything all day and I've been looking forward to this since yesterday so oh. there you go uh, lasagna half cooked and then finished off the next day um, got the idea can't claim, credit for, can't claim credit for it myself I'll put a link down below in the video description to the original recipe mm. from and I apologize once again Rita calm down this is mm. a family show <laughs> I apologize once again if I'm mispronouncing your name but uh, I got the idea for this from Adam Ragasay's YouTube channel. I do recommend it. You need to try this, seriously. <laughs> That's really nice. <laughs> <That's bad. laughs> oh my god, it's a family. <laughs> seriously. Take, take care, folks. I'll catch you next time. Bye. <laughs>